of a Christian. And, and while that, that thought of becoming the best version of ourselves, you know, we always talk about, man, you just got to become the best version of yourself. I don't know about you, but I want to become the best version of Jesus in me. I, I, I want to become the best version of Jesus. Can I just tell you that? The best version that Mike can be of, of the role model of my Savior is Jesus. That, that's who I want to become like, right? And so I think this morning as we make that our pursuit, um, we have to understand that, that Jesus really uh, implores us to, to recognize uh, that following him entails a, a, a lot of things. It entails, obviously, surrender our life. It, it entails healing. It entails salvation. It entails hope that, that just like Janet, when, when, when she, Janet uh, uh, Short, when she was uh, ready to close her eyes on this side of life, she had the confidence and the hope to know that when her eyes uh, uh, opened up, she would be in the presence of the Lord, you know. I mean, that that's what comes with being a follower of Jesus, but also what comes with, with being a follower of Jesus is this, this readiness to carry on his mission, this readiness to follow him into places wherever he would go, wherever he went in the scripture is where he's still going today. And part of that is really um, uh, cultivating our hearts to have a readiness not only to receive his message, but also how many know to give that out to tell others about this message of Jesus Christ. And that's what, we're in this series called Each One Reach One. And it's all about continuing to carry on the mission and the relationship that we have with Jesus. And, and, uh, and, this, and, the, and we've been talking about the urgency. Everybody say urgency. There's, there's, this, there's this urgency that we, we, we see in the life of Jesus when, when, when he would go out and when he would meet with people and talk with people, when he would look at a crowd, Matthew chapter 9, we've been just unpacking that chapter, that portion of Scripture where Jesus saw this great crowd and, and he didn't see what they were wearing, he didn't see what, you know, if they were Roman or if they were Greek or if they were Samaritan or if they were Jew, and he didn't see if they were rich or poor, young or old, woman, uh, man man, a child. He just saw people as they really were. They, he saw them as people who needed a miracle. He saw them as people who were helpless and harassed. He saw them as people that, that, that needed uh, the church, that needed the message of, of who he is and what he uh, has done for you. He saw that and, and he's called us into that. And so we've been looking at each one of us reaching one person every year of our life until Jesus decides to take us home. I mean, what better use of our life, amen? We are never more like Jesus than when we are loving people and when we are, when we are sharing uh, the hope that we have found in Jesus Christ. And so this, this, this looking upon the harvest, Jesus looked out at this group of people and he said, man, the harvest is plentiful. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send more labors into my field. And so we've been really, as we've been talking about becoming more like Jesus, we want to become more uh, like him. We want to be intentional. That word is so important, intentionality. To be intentional about this, achieving the, this likeness to Christ really requires an intentional effort. How many know that? Don't you just wish that somehow a magic wand, you'd wake up, you'd have one day, you'd wake up the next day, and, and you'd be just like Jesus. You wouldn't have to struggle with those same addictions and, and, and hang-ups and habits and, and those accusations from your past, the things that you just can't quite get free from, the things that you've tried to forget but just keep haunting you. I mean, wouldn't it just be nice that they, that would all be erased? You know, like men in black, you know, they just take that and go beep, you know, and they go, you know. Don't you wish there were men in white? I, that was just, that was just, that was just, that was just natural right there. It has to be intentional. We have to have intentional effort. And as we deliberately seek to draw closer to him, we discover that, that his likeness encompasses this deep concern for people's welfare and their need to encounter this transformative power of his grace. And everybody say grace. Um, our hearts then has to become this place. First, before we deliver a message, our hearts have to become 
this, this fertile ground through which we can reach out to other people's lives, leading them into a relationship with Jesus. So today, I want to talk about um, preparing our hearts. Once again, uh, next week, we're going to kind of shift gears in this series, and we're going to talk about actually how to do this. How do we share the gospel message? What is the gospel exactly, and, and how do we share the gospel? What, how do we do that? We're going to talk about that, but today... I want to talk about preparing our hearts to reach, um, to reach out to people, uh, and I want to talk about an area that Jesus talked about often. Uh, I want to talk about heaven and hell. As we talk about reaching people, as we talk, uh, talk about the welfare of our own lives and the welfare of other people, and as we talk about preparing our hearts, we have to talk about this place of heaven and hell, because they are very two real places and Jesus knew that, and I, I think that was a part of the urgency. He knew that something uh, was was uh, that something was waiting. That something that 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 life is more than just the 70, 80, 90, 100 years that we may have on this planet. It, it, there's more because the truth of the matter is, every one of us spends forever somewhere. This is not all there is, and we make decisions and choices now of where we are going to spend eternity. And it's so important that we understand this as people. And if you're here this morning, you're online, and, and maybe, again, you're not a Christian, or maybe you're, you're just checking church out, and you go, oh, great, here's another church talking about hell. Well, I'm going to talk about heaven, too, okay? But, yeah, I do want to talk about hell this morning. Uh, and I want to talk about it because it's a part of the urgency that as Christians we must feel, that we must live in. To understand that, that, that this mission, that this call to share the gospel, th th there's a lot at stake. People's lives are at stake, right? We live in a very comfortable country. As divided and as hard as the economic times are, man, we still live very comfortably, considering. And so it's real easy not to think about the hardships of hell, the hardships of what happens after life, or, or how do we prepare for that? It, because we're just living in the now. We're living in the comfort of now. We're living in the provision of now. We don't really think about that. But we want to understand that the urgency of our mission is further underscored by, by this reality of a heaven and a reality of a hell. There, there's an eternal destination awaiting every single person. And Jesus frequently spoke of these, these two realms. Uh, many of his parables uh, talked, about, uh, talked a lot about hell. He talked a lot about heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke about heaven first. It was, it was his first message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his first message. And he continued to talk about heaven until the, t well, even after he died and rose again. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says that he appeared to his disciples and began to talk to them about the kingdom of heaven again. It was his first message, and it was his last message. Jesus was all about helping us to understand what heaven really is and where it is and, and how we are to participate it. To, to participate in heaven, both, both now as we're living here and one day when we, when we close our eyes on this side of eternity and we wake up in, in, in eternity. We, we wake up in heaven. And so there is, this, there is this understanding that there are consequences. And Jesus spoke about uh, hell, and he, and, but he also let us know that, that hell was originally prepared not for people. These are the things we need to know about hell. So anyways... Uh, today I want to I want to just unpack this very very important topic because I believe it it needs to prepare our hearts. It needs to give us a sense of urgency. If you've ever if you've ever watched a show where where first responders or or military or they're being trained or maybe maybe uh, uh, you know people who go into and rescue people there's when they train how many know there's a sense of urgency even in their training why. Because people's lives are at stake. That what, what they're going to do matters, right? And this is this, is this room this morning, whether you're at home or you're, or you're here, this is a part of that training of, of being Christians, of being followers of Jesus, that we have to understand that a lot is at stake in people's lives and our lives. But for those of us who have accepted Christ, man, we're, 
We're, we're saved. But there are a lot of people, our family members, our co-workers, uh, uh, friends in, at school and, and our neighbors who don't know Jesus yet. And, and there's got to be that sense of first responders, that sense of, man, when we show up on the scene, there's this, there, we're, we're not just yawning, we're not just eating a, taking a bite of burrito and going, okay, I'm going to go over and do, okay, I'm going to take another. No, it's this, man, th- it's their sense of urgency, right? This is what Jesus is really talking about when he talks about hell and he talks about the consequences of hell. And so I just want you to to know that Jesus taught on hell often. Uh, He taught on heaven often. He taught on heaven to, to help us to understand that the kingdom of heaven is now here as we live, but also going to become in even more fullness when he comes back, right? So he talked about heaven a lot, but he talked about hell just as much in a lot of ways. A lot of his parables parables could could be considered apocalyptic. In other words, talking about the end times. Jesus talked about heaven and hell a lot. And from his first message, he let us know what hell was all about. And in the Bible, you have to know that hell is, is, is there, there's, there's, there's like four words that describe hell, different different facets of death and different facets of life. And I don't want to get into those. I'm not going to get into the weeds of those words because that's not the point of the message. But I will tell you that the four words are Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna. Those are the four words that are, that are used in the Greek and the Hebrew to just, that the Bible uses to, to transcribe and to translate this place, this realm where God is not. This place where there is an absence of everything that is right and good and whole. This place that there is an absence of any kind of hope or love or peace of any kind. This, these are the four words and, and, and they mean everything from the grave to the place that, have, that has been set aside for at the end of the age where, 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 where Satan and his angels, his demons, uh, will be thrown in and cast in uh, for all eternity along with those people who why they, while they live said, I, 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 I'm choosing not to accept Christ as my Savior. I'm choosing not to be reconciled to God. And I'll cover that in just a little bit towards the end of this message. But, but that, that's, that's hell. And, and this morning, hell is for those really who, who do not believe. The, and, and the parable of, of the weeds, Matthew chapter 13, I'm not going to build. I'm just going to give you some references. Because I want you to see the pattern of teaching that Jesus spoke on. That he wasn't quiet on this subject and neither can we. We cannot be quiet in the church. But we must handle hell rightly. Especially when we go outside of here and begin to live with this urgency of, of, of this eternal uh, understanding. We, we have to understand how to wield this information so that we don't, we don't yell at people. We don't tell people they're going to hell because we're angry with them. Or at least we sound like we're angry with them. Because of the way they're living. We, you know what I'm saying? If we don't understand this in here, then we can actually abuse it out there. And thinking that we're doing good because we're trying to rescue people from this godlessness and this, and this eternal place of, of nothing and no hope and torment. And so we must understand that hell, so Jesus taught on this. So Matthew chapter 13 It's a parable uh, Jesus taught on in the parable of the weeds. And he talked about a a field that that, that a farmer sowed seeds and and he had it all ready and they went to sleep. And it says the next time they woke up, there was there there was the crop was growing, but along with it were these weeds, and they couldn't understand how how they they looked to the owner. Didn't you plant good seed? And he said, Man, I planted great seed, but 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 Jesus is saying it wasn't the owner who planted the bad seed, it was the enemy. You see, the enemy plant, and so these, these weeds and the, and the tares and the, and the fruit of the harvest, they were all grown together. And he, Jesus used this example to, to talk about the end of time. And, and in verse 40 of 13, of Matthew chapter 13, he says, and, and, and at the end of the age, I'm going to send my angels, and they're going to harvest both the weeds and the wheat, or the fruit, 
And it says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do, do evil. They will throw them in a, into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. He goes on to say as he's teaching in verse 49, he says, This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus begins to give us an idea of what hell looks like and, and what goes on there. We get a, we get a glimpse, glimpse of hell uh, as we look at Luke chapter 16, and I want to kind of go through this as I, I, I told you to turn there. But Luke chapter 16 offers this incredibly clear glimpse into, into hell and how, how, a person, um, uh, how a person who would be there, what they would experience and what they would be concerned with. So Jesus gives us an insight in this, and so he leaves no room for ambiguity. Uh, he, he, he lets us know. So Luke chapter 16, verse 19, Jesus goes on with the teaching that he's been in already, but he says this, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury at his gate. Let you know he had a pretty nice place. He had a gate to his home. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for the scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly bank. We have to understand that in this context, when Jesus was speaking this, the Jews really looked at this thing of Abraham's bosom uh, because they sat around tables and ate together, right? I mean, and they were on pillows, and they would often, after eating, they'd often lean against each other and talk, you know? They would just kind of, you, 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 have you ever done that? You need a back rest once in a while. It's kind of like, hey, could you just let me lean against you a little bit? We get this picture of Jesus in the Last Supper where John leaned against Jesus' bosom. He was had his head on his chest, right? So when Jesus is talking about, about this picture of heaven and hell, the Jews would relate to Abraham being the father of faith that now whoever dies in, 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 in God actually goes into this place of this great uh, place, a position of, of, um, uh, of comfort, of this place of of, of priority and preference and notoriety. You, you, it doesn't matter who you are in this life. Man, when, when you die in God, when you die in this Jewish faith, you're ushered into this Abraham's bosom. It just means paradise. It means heaven. So he's saying that, that finally the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. Again, you can see that in heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And he went to the place of the dead. That, that's Sheol or, or, or Gehenna, okay? So no, that, that's Sheol or Hades, this place of the dead, the grave. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distant with Lazarus at his, at his side. We get a glimpse that, that somehow hell and heaven, we can see. There, 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 there's, we're, we're able to see across this, this divide, this separation, right? And so he, he, he shouts, the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water that he may cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. Now, this is Jesus speaking this. If anybody knows what, what this place, this hell, this, this separation for God, if anybody knows what that looks like, it would be Jesus. He's explaining it's a place of flame, flame. It's a place of suffering. It's a place where, where people are just longing for somebody to come and just dip their finger in some water to, to, to give them a second relief, a second of relief in their life. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he's here being comforted and you are in anguish. 
And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least, everybody say at least, at least send him to my father's house. We're getting a glimpse of what people endure in this place of suffering, but what is most on their mind? Please, at least send him to my brothers, right? Please, Father, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them already. Your brothers can read what they wrote. In other words, they have the word of God. They have prophets telling them. Then the rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. That is, a, that is an incredible picture of what we're talking about today. It's an incredible picture of, and, and, uh, of just the torment and what is on the mind of people who are in this place called hell. And, and, we, and this parable really isn't just about hell. It's really about, in context, it's about not doing with your life uh, what, what you really could have done while you were alive. It's really about being self-centered and where that lands you in eternity. Okay, that, that, is, that, that is the thing. But in the midst of this teaching, Jesus gives us a glimpse of hell. He gives us a glimpse of heaven. You see, we have to live in light of this thing called eternity. There's a dichotomy of heaven and hell, and it needs to compel us to live with a sense of urgency, recognizing that life is fragile, recognizing that there's an inter- eternal significance to our choices. Our actions in the present really determine our destiny in eternity, and so that should urge us to embrace Christ, not only His reconciling love for us, but to share it with others. This is a part of preparing our heart because heaven and hell are real. They, these are the two places that a person can spend eternity in. These are the two places that, that, that uh, we have the choice. And I said it to the guys on Friday night. I said, guys, we only have really two choices where we're going to put our faith. We only have two places that we can put our trust in. We can either put our trust in God who loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son that if, that if we would recognize that, we would not perish. Or we can choose to put our faith in mankind. We can choose to put our faith in our own culture, in mankind. In other words, we can put our faith in ourselves. And I just looked at everybody and said, How, how's that working out for us? And so there's really only these two choices. And so these are very real places, and it all depends on who we choose to serve while we're alive. You see, life is fragile. James chapter 4, James is really not talking about eternity, but he's talking about this this pride that comes into a Christian's life. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to do this or to that city, we will spend a year there, we will carry on business, and we will make money. Verse 14 of James 4, why Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. James says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for just a little while and then it vanishes. Some of the translations says, life is but a vapor. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this and we will do that. In other words, there has to be this sense that life is fragile, that we are not promised tomorrow. All of us in here, those of us online, we could probably relate to to someone who has been close to us, that seemingly everything was fine, and in a moment, they were gone. And we're just thinking, wow. I mean, there's nothing that sobers us up quicker than when somebody in our family dies prematurely. Someone of our friends die of, of this unexpected end that we never could have seen, we never could have thought of. And it's just like, something's not right here. 
because life is fragile. We're not promises. And this, this, and if you're here this morning and you're you and you're not a follower of Jesus, you may, you're just still checking out church or online. You just need to hear this message, not because I'm telling you you're going to go to hell if you don't accept Jesus. I mean that is a truth, but I want you to hear as Christians. This is why we're so urgent. This is why we're so. Uh, set on sharing this message because we know that the consequences of not hearing this message, the consequences of you not having the opportunity to choose where, how you want to live your life now, who you want to serve now, and who, where you want to spend eternity, we, we know that God has commissioned us to bring this message to you so that you can make a decision. You can make your own choice because that is how much God loves you. It's how much he loves me. It's to give me choice. Knowing that I might not choose to choose him. That's love. That's love. To choose who are we, to choose who we are going to serve. To choose who we are are going to love, to choose who we are going to have and place our trust and our faith in. That's how much God loves us. None of us are promised tomorrow. None of our friends, none of our family members, none of our co-workers, none, none of our classmates, none of us are promised tom tomorrow, even though it seems like life just keeps going on, right? Sun comes up every day. Comes up every day. Sets every night. Comes up every day. Sets every night. Things just continue as always. And we can, we can lose our sense of this, this, this fragileness or the fragility of life. We can, and not, and not, not just for our own life, but for those around us. Hell is for real. This is not just, there's a doctrine of hell but the reality of this, this is a destination. This is a destiny for people's lives, for our lives. And God sent his son to rescue us from that. He says in his word, he says, this message of the kingdom of heaven will be preached everywhere and then the end will come. He's urging us to have this sense of, of mission, of this sense of our purpose in sharing the gospel. And may our hearts be conditioned not just to yell at people that if they don't get right, they're going to go to hell, but to let them know that, yeah, hell is a real place, but that has not been designed for you. God never created, people often ask, how can a loving God send people to hell? It's a great question. The answer is, is he doesn't. The irony of it is we send ourselves. We send ourselves either to heaven or hell. We send ourselves to heaven by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Why Jesus because Jesus is God's hand extended to us, saying, I want a relationship with you, and I have sent my son to remove everything that has kept you and I separated. Jesus took everything of, of our failures, of our wrong decisions, of our fantasies, of the things that go on even now and will go on tomorrow in our lives. Jesus has paid that price and has severed that sin nature from us. And so that's why Jesus is such an... It, 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 you, you can't get to God except through Jesus because Jesus has made the way for us. And once we do that... He, he begins not only to live within us, but he severs this, this deadly attachment to our, our desires that destroy us. He severs the sin nature, that, that self-centered nature, and we have that choice to live there. Let me ask you a question. What kind of God would God be 
if he gave people 70, 80, 90 years and they said, I want nothing to do with God. I want nothing to do with religion. I want nothing to do with Jesus. I, don't, I just want to live my life the way I want to live it. God says, as much as that kills me, as much as I died for that, you have that choice. What kind of God would, would, would he be if that person, when he died, God says, I'm putting you in heaven? You say, it would be a pretty good God. No, the, the person never wanted anything to do with God. Why would God force a person like that to spend eternity in a place he wanted nothing to do with, with a person he wanted nothing to be around? I mean, what kind of God would that be? He'd be a manipulative dictator that's going to get his way no matter what. That's why he gives us the choice. Every person a choice. And we just need to make sure that every person has a representation of that message. Of this gospel of how much God loves them and how much God has given them choice. And he's just saying, if choose life. Choose life. Because you have the opportunity to choose death. Friends, this is, this is the urgency in Revelation chapter 20. I just got to read this because this is another part of the reality. It says then in verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. Who do you think, he's there, who do you think the John is talking about here? Jesus. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence. That is the magnitude of his greatness. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book, or in these books. Now the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the reality. And I can't tell you how many times that I've heard of somebody that was on the verge of passing away or somebody that, you know, had just passed away and and. And, I want, and I, all I had to think was, wow, that's really sad. I'm, I'm so sad for their, their family. I, 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 I just and I can't believe it. Uh, but nothing very rarely hits me of their eternal reality. Did I, something inside me has to go, God, where were they at? What, what was going on? God, had, uh, and, and you know, there, there's got to be this sense that, that that's got to factor into our, our lives as Christians. Not just for our own lives, but for our families, for all who, don't, who do not know Christ yet, right? I love Francis Chan. Many of you know him. He's written many books. He wrote a book called Erasing Hell. And he says this, and I just need to quote him, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close. He says, let's not miss the very purpose for these lively warnings things I just got done sharing. God wants us to do more than intellectually agree with the words of Scripture. He wants us to live in light of them. Like the ER doctor who shocks the dead back to life, belief in hell should rescue our complacent hearts from the suffocating grip of passivity. We are ambassadors of Christ. We cannot look at people from a worldly point of view any longer. We have been given the message of reconciliation. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. You and I are very well equipped, no matter who you are. If you're a follower of Jesus, His Holy Spirit lives within you and I. His Word so readily available. 
we are equipped to bring this reconciliation, but we have to stop looking at people through the eyes of the culture, like, like we look at everybody else. We have to look at them like Jesus saw them, as helpless and harassed, sheep without a shepherd. We have to be willing to be those first responders spiritually. I love 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Can you just say thank you, Lord, that he's patient with you and I? He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You don't have to wonder if the person you're thinking, looking at across the aisle, on the street corner, whatever way they're dressed, you don't have to think, God, do you want to save that person? You don't have to think, God, are they too far gone? You don't have to think that. He's not willing that anyone would perish, that all would be saved. All would come to repentance. All would have a change of not just their actions, but the way they think and therefore the way they live. That is life. That is transformation. And that's what Jesus offers. In light of this sense of urgency that's inherent in, in Christ's mission for our life, we must respond with prayer like we've been talking about, fervent prayer. And tonight, you don't want to miss that opportunity. We're going to pray for the lost. We're going to pray for our community. We're going to pray for the people who God's laying on our hearts. But we must respond with fervent prayer and then action. We must accept God's imita invitation to, to not just choose life with him, but actually to commit ourselves to reaching one person at a time, to, to offering that to others because the stakes are high. So I guess my heart is, is, can we just embrace this urgency? Can we just pray, God, give me eyes to see again. Not just what people are dealing with in their soul, but God, how close are they to eternity? There are people right next door to us that only have days to live. We don't know that. I mean, we don't understand that, but... There are people that are driving right by this highway today that won't make it today. They'll be, they'll be dead by the end of today. It happens all around us. And I'm not saying to walk around with such a heaviness that we're just downers, but with a sense of urgency that, God, if, if I have an opportunity, if you'll show me, I'll take it. I'll step into it. Because heaven and hell are in the balance. Would you bow your heads, please? <sighs> Father, this morning, I just take a moment right now in the closing times of this service. And I pray, God, for our hearts. I pray that our hearts would be cultivated with a love for people, a love for you. But Lord, also that you would cultivate a heart of, of this reality of eternity and and that, that once we pass from this life into eternity, everything is sealed, God. There's no turning back. There's no, there's no do-overs after that, God. It is sealed in a person's life. Lord, give us an urgency in reaching those who are perishing. I pray that over my life, I pray that over every person in this room and those online this morning, if, you, if, if that's your prayer, would you just please ask God, please give me an urgency to reach those who are perishing around me. Show me, God. Show us, God, who, are, who you've been dealing with, Holy Spirit, who are close to eternity, who are close to leaving this life and, and entering in, God, to, a, to either a Christ-filled eternity or a Christless eternity. God, that, that's our action item. God, is just to pray. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're seeing and what you're speaking, Holy Spirit. Help us to be strategic Help us to be prepared. Help us to be obedient, God. Second, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I just, I want to give those in this room and online the invitation to accept God's offer to choose life today. Maybe during the course of this message, you've seen how you've been choosing to place your faith in mankind, in philosophy, in self-help books, You've chosen to place your faith maybe in your family and how they've raised you, and if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. You've, been, you've chosen now. You've seen how you've, just, you've placed your faith and your trust in yourself. 
you're recognizing that that is a dead-end cycle for you. God says today, choose life by transferring your faith from yourself and from mankind and place it on me today. And the way you do that is to acknowledge that Jesus is his son and that Jesus was raised from the dead. He is not in the grave. He is not some dead philosopher or some dead great teacher. He is the resurrected living Savior. And he has his hand outstretched to you. And if you will open your heart today, he'll come in. How do you open your heart? You confess with your mouth. And you choose to believe in your heart who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you in that confession because I say it all the time, you're just a heartfelt prayer away. You have God's attention today. He knows you. He knows where you're at online, at home, at work, wherever you're at. He knows where you're living. He knows the condition of your heart. He knows your struggles. He knows your questions about faith. And he is simply saying, I am standing at the door of your heart and I am knocking. Would you just open up and allow me to come in and to save you, to heal you, and to restore you? And if you want to make that confession today right where you're at, you don't have to get up, you don't have to do any weird stuff, you just have to be willing to confess from your heart with your mouth. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand up and say, Mike, include me in that prayer. Include me in this prayer. I don't want to wait another day. I don't want to wait another moment because I know that I'm not promised the next hour of my life. Just raise your hand and say, Mike, include me in this prayer. Include me in this prayer. Just slip your hand up. I just, I, I just want you to have an opportunity there's something about reaching your hand up that says, God, I want to put my hand in your hand today. So just slip your hand up and say, God, see me. I'm serious about my relationship with you. Anybody at all? Those online, there's pastors online right now. You just have to let them know. Raise a hand. Type in something that lets them know that you want to accept Christ as your Savior. Anybody else? I'm just going to wait another moment. Just, It's too important to let this pass by. Thank you. Anybody else? Be brave enough, courageous enough to say, today's the day. Father. God, you know every heart here today. You know every life. You know every moment of their days, God. I pray that not one person would leave this room today, whether they've raised their hand or not. They would not leave this room today and have their eternity not settled with you. If you're here in this room and you raised your hand or you didn't, but you want to accept Christ, if you're online and you want to accept Christ, I'm going to have you repeat this prayer. And if you'll say it from your heart, God listens to that. So if that's you, I just want you to repeat this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I accept your gift of love today. And that gift is Jesus Christ. I recognize today how much you love me. Because you sent him to rescue me from me. And today, I'm asking you to come into my life, to come into my heart, not just my mind, but my heart also. I surrender. I want to stop living a self-centered life, and I want to start living a Christ-centered life today. So please help me. I believe, Jesus, that you are God's Son, and I believe, I choose to place my faith that God raised you from the dead. 
so that I could have a new life through your resurrection. So today, fill me with your presence. Clothe me with your spirit today. I want all that you have for me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we thank the Lord this morning for his word and for those who gave their hearts to Christ today? Would you stand to your feet? Thank you, Lord.